Hello and welcome to the Unit 4 tutorial for Ed Scratch. In this video we're going to be looking at sensors and how you can use sensors in Ed Scratch to make Edison interact with the outside world. To start with we're going to look at the four drive blocks we skipped in a previous video. These are forwards until, backwards until, left until and right until. Now unlike the drive 4 blocks above them, these have a diamond shape input that is currently empty and is empty when you drag it out of the block palette. This is a conditional input. Now a conditional input needs a statement to become either true or false and in this case we are looking for a statement inside these blocks that becomes true to stop the motors from moving. So the conditional inputs can be found in the sensing category. Now inside here you can see we have a bunch of different conditional inputs and we can drag and drop these out and directly into the conditional input of the drive. So this conditional has a input of its own and we can see that this says now forwards until triangle button pressed at speed 5. Which means Edison is going to drive forwards at speed 5 until you press the triangle button. And we can do this for all of the other drive until blocks as well. We can put button presses into each and every one of those. I'll also point out that these inputs do need to be filled for this program to actually work and compile. And you can see down in the bug box that it is highlighting that we need to put a condition inside our conditional input just like that. So as I mentioned, these conditionals can resolve to either be true or false. And in this case, we are waiting for them to be true. And then when they do become true, we're going to stop the motors. So each of these drive blocks starts the motors and then waits for this condition to become true. And then when the condition has become true, it stops the motors and moves on to the next block, which is a very interesting and easy way of making Edison drive until something happens. In a similar way, we can control the flow of a program until something happens using the wait until and repeat until blocks from the control section. So if we go ahead and place the round button pressed into each of these, the wait until is going to hold Edison at this point in the program until this round button is pressed. So it's not going to move on until the condition is met and becomes true. So it's just going to sit there holding Edison there in that point in the program until something happens to make that true and it moves on to the next block. In this case, our next block is the repeat until and I'm going to change this input to a triangle button pressed. So in this case, the repeat is going to repeat any blocks you put inside of it, which I'm going to add a couple of music notes to just like this. So this block is now going to repeat these music notes over and over and over again until this condition becomes true. An important thing to note here is that this condition is only ever checked at the very top of the loop. So in this case, it is going to check this condition as it first starts the loop. If the condition is false, then it is going to go in here and it's going to play both notes before looping back around and checking the condition again. So if at any point during these two notes the triangle button is pressed, say in between the two notes, it's still going to play the final note before coming back around, realizing the triangle button has been pressed. And once it knows that the triangle button has been pressed, all the condition that is put in here has become true. It then skips the blocks inside of it and goes to the end of the loop and then continues on with the program. In this case, there is nothing attached to the end of this loop, so the program would finish. These aren't the only ways we can control the flow of a program though. We can also use the if and if else blocks. So we have a look at these and drag these out. As you can see, as with the drive until blocks, these have a diamond shape conditional input that we can add a condition to. Unlike the drive until blocks though, these blocks are going to do something different based on the input. So we'll start with the if statement. If we connect the if statement directly to the start here and then place a beep inside the if statement, the if statement will only allow Edison to run this beep if the round button has been pressed. So in this case, the conditional is saying, if this condition here is true, then run the blocks that are inside. So if we add some extra notes in here, we can play a couple of notes and then it will move on. But 
If the round button has not been pressed when we get to this point in the program, it is going to skip the beeps and the play notes and it's going to move on directly into the next part of the program, which in this case is an if else statement. An if else statement works very similar to an if statement, but this time we're telling the robot not only what to do when the condition is true, but also what to do when the condition is false. So in this case, when we get to this point in our program at the if else point, if the triangle button has been pressed, then it's going to beep. And if the triangle button has not been pressed, then it's going to play a whole C before moving on with the program. So you can think of an if and an if else as being very similar things except for the if only tells the robot what to do when the condition is true and the if else tells the robot what to do when the condition is true and when the condition is not true. So it's slightly more powerful but in some cases you only care about what's happening when the condition is true and don't care what's happening when the condition is not true. That way you can use the if statement. Just like the loops from a previous video if and if else blocks can be nested inside each other. So this way you can check multiple conditions at once. So in this case, we could say, if the triangle button is pressed, beep. If the triangle button is not pressed, but a clap has been detected. So this is triangle button not pressed and a clap detected. Then we're going to turn on an LED. And if the clap has not been detected, then we're gonna turn the left LED off just like that. So as you can see, you can either stack these or nest them. And as with the loops, you can stack or nest as many of them as you like to get your program to work the way you want it to. So now we know where our conditions go and what they can be used for. Let's take a look at the types of conditions that we can pull into this program, starting with the sensing category. So inside here, you can see we have a bunch of different conditions and we also have a couple of extra blocks at the top. We'll get to these in just a minute. So the conditions that we have in here are clap detected, round or triangle button press, which can be changed with an input dropdown, an obstacle detected anywhere, ahead, left or right. Then we have the line tracker, which can be on a reflective or a non-reflective surface. We have a remote code received, an IR message detected from another Edison, or drive strain detected, which is where the wheels are not moving on Edison. So all of these uh, condition inputs can be placed inside an if statement just as uh, anything else, just like this. However, some of these condition inputs need extra things to be turned on. So for Edison to detect an obstacle, you need to turn on the obstacle detection beam because otherwise Edison isn't looking for obstacles. Edison only looks for obstacles when you tell Edison to look for obstacles. And so inside the sensing category, there is a turn obstacle detection beam block. So we can put this at the start of our program and turn it on. And then if we want to, we can also put it at the end of our program and turn it off. However, unless you're using messages or remote control codes, you don't really need to worry about turning it off. If you are using messages and remote control codes, make sure to turn the obstacle detection beam off before you try and use IR messages or remote codes. Similarly to the obstacle detection, the line tracker also needs to be turned on before it will work. And once again, there is just a block inside the sensing palette which allows you to turn the line tracking LED on. If the line tracking LED is not turned on, there is nothing to reflect up off the surface so Edison can't see if there is a line below. The final block in this set that is not an input block is a clear sensor data block. Now this block allows you to manually clear the data that is in a sensor. So you can do this if you want to and if your program calls for it. Sometimes when you have multiple nested loops, some sensor data can stay stuck in a sensor while you're looping through and you may need to use the clear block to clear the data. Finishing out this list are remote codes that are received from a TV remote control and IR messages, which are received, messages received from another Edison, which can actually be found inside the LEDs category. So you can send an IR message yourself by clicking and send IR message block into the program and adding a number into there to send that number as a message to a different Edison. 
Finally down here we have the drive strain which as I mentioned before is when Edison's wheels are not moving but you've told them to try and move. Also as a reminder keep an eye on your bug box as you are going through and programming your Edison. As you can see right now this program is probably not going to do what we expect it to do because we have a yellow error message telling us that the drive strain is only going to trigger when the motors are turned on. So as you can see Edison is not driving at any point in this program so the drive strain detected block is not going to be activated which means it will just skip everything inside this if statement every single time it runs this program because this block is never going to become true. So these conditions are the key way of using these sensors inside Edison. All of these blocks that appear in the sensing category are your primary way of using these sensors. However, there is a secondary way which we have seen in a previous video. This is the events category. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, you can only have one of each different type of event and they run by interrupting the main program, wherever the main program is, running any blocks that are in underneath them, and then jumping back to where the main program left off. These events line up pretty much directly with all of the sensing uh, blocks that we have just seen, and they mention a specific event. So there are no drop downs on any of these. They are exactly one type of event or one type of sensor data that is coming into Edison. So in this case, I have any obstacle detected and obstacle detected ahead. And you can see down through here that all of the blocks that we covered in the sensing category also have an equivalent inside the events category. And that is the end of the Unit 4 tutorial for Ed Scratch. In the Unit 5 tutorial, we'll be looking at variables and manipulating data.